helping women find work that fits their lives. And that means that I stay on top of flexible work trends and I help both employers and employees create work arrangements that work for women. And that's because women often have four big jobs, a professional role, as well as caring for children and aging parents and households too. So with COVID, uh, flexible work was suddenly available to everyone. And on the one hand, that was a great thing uh, because uh, it cut out a long commute for lots of women. Um, but it also pitched women into a quagmire often of caring for children and homeschooling children at the same time. Uh, but uh, the other good thing is that this unexpected experiment has shown everyone that flexible work does work in all industries and at all levels because now doctors and lawyers and office workers of all kinds have shown that they are meeting deadlines and they're continuing to get work done. So um, today's webinar is sponsored by Haven as part of their career forum series. And at its core, Haven is a platform to help women connect and explore ways to navigate personal and professional journeys. And all of this is facilitated by the most beautiful workspace I have ever seen. And I, if you haven't seen it yet, I encourage you to get down there and, and take a look. And um, our other uh, co-sponsor is Connect Talent, and they are an innovative boutique recruiting firm that is fully devoted to helping women, especially moms who've been on hi hiatus, um, find employers who value work-life balance. And I'm always on the lookout for great firms like Connect Talent, who are very strong advocates for working women and who, um, you know, women who need the bandwidth to cultivate both their careers and their families. And today we are so pleased to have two great speakers on our webinar panel today. Um, first is Rachel Cashel, who is an employment law partner at Robinson and Cole, a national firm, um, and her office is in Stamford, Connecticut. And as a firm partner, she has a vested interest in the firm staying competitive and offering family-friendly policies. Our other panelist is Brooke Tulaski, who is an HR manager at Terex Corporation, a global manufacturer of lifting and material processing products that's based in Westport, Connecticut. And as an HR manager, Brooke's on the front line, um, helping the company create a workplace that helps all employees find work-life balance. So now we're going to get started um, with the panel. And I'm going to ask um, Brooke first, um, how um, has all of this work from home policy um, played out at your company? Is it something that you were allowing pre-pandemic or did it just start when everyone was sent home everywhere? And what are some of the things that have worked and maybe not worked? Sure, so we actually had a formal works from home policy um, that we implemented probably two years ago, I think in 2018. Um, and that was a US wide program um, that allowed people to um, flex their schedule depending on their preferences. So if they wanted to work from home a couple days a week, they could, or if they wanted to change their hours, they could do that as well. Um, so we definitely had a program put in place prior to COVID. Um, certainly, we didn't have everybody taking advantage of it. Uh, actually, it was, it was a pretty small population of people who were um, taking advantage of the program, but COVID obviously forced everybody um, in the US to work from home. So it was a much, um, different situation than what we expected, but I think for 
for people getting set up on the tech side, that was probably a little bit of a challenge. I mean, our IT department obviously did not expect to have everybody on the VPN. Um, so that was, that was a challenge. But I think outside of that, it was a really smooth transition. Um, you know, people are now, have been working from home since the second week in March. Um, and we've proven that we can truly do our jobs from home and do them well. Um, we've had, I work in our corporate headquarters, so we've had, um, you know, our finance team members there doing the um, month end accounting closes, quarter end closes on time, um, which is, which is a huge feat. So um, things have mostly been going well. Um, and I think, I think going forward, it's something that people are going to look at more closely um, when we do have the option to go back into the office. Well, that's great. Now, why do you think there was hesitancy before COVID um, to take advantage of the work from home program? I think there's probably a couple reasons. I mean, one is some managers, I mean, this was a US wide program and we had policies in place and um, it was supported from the CEO. Um, so it was definitely supported in that sense, but some managers are just that old school mentality where they think that you have to be in the office to do work. And so I think some team members just feel felt like it was kind of a don't even ask type of thing because it, it's not gonna work for you. But our program is, is truly designated to allow team members to prove how their schedule is going to work out. So when we have them fill out forms that um, they put their plan in writing, they have to explain, you know, I'm gonna be working from home two days a week, but this is how I'm gonna make it work for myself and for the business. So there was a little, there has been a little bit of pushback in some areas, um, but I think the most part people just maybe don't, um, maybe feel like they're missing out on things when all of their other coworkers are in the office. But I, again, I think this situation has really changed people's perspective, perspectives on things. And I think both sides of it, both the managers and the team members will be a little bit more accepting going forward. Yeah, it's, it's terrific um, to, you know, to take away that feeling that it's not gonna work. Now we know it's, it works, so that's, that's great. Um, so Rachel, um, one of the things in my work that I've been so interested in is the fact that law firms have really gotten on the board of more uh, flexibility and work-life balance. I know Working Women Magazine has a um, you know, 50 or 60 best law firms to work at for, for women now, which would have been unheard of even 10 years ago, certainly. 20 years ago, you know, that wasn't a place you were going to find flexibility. So what was the situation pre-COVID and now with COVID at your firm? So pre-COVID, um, there we've always had a lot of flexibility in terms of trying to help all of our lawyers, not just women, but all of our lawyers manage their family responsibilities because we are seeing more to um, to a partner working households, not partner, law firm partner, you know, um, domestic partner. Um, so we've injected flexibility sort of pre-COVID. I'm not sure everything was reduced to po written policies and, you know, strict procedures, but we've ha we've always had a lot of flexibility. Um, our law, law firm particularly, we essentially bill by the hour. So it's really a productivity analysis. So as long as clients are being served and, um, co-workers and colleagues are being respected. So, you know, if you work super late at night to catch up, obviously you can't expect somebody to be on the other end of that email. Um, we've always had a lot of flexibility. I would say COVID has changed. And I think this was mentioned before, seeing what parts of the model work and having people who, who were skeptical understand that it, we can work remotely. Um, some, you know, there's definitely some loss of collegiality and we've done, we've int introduced a lot of measures to try to make up for that. Um, but certainly in terms of getting our work done, law firms are a pretty good model because we can do a lot remotely to begin with. All you really need is the laptop and good internet access. So I think it's just sort of helped people and forced people who maybe were apprehensive of working remotely to give it a try and, and see some of the benefits of it. So um, what do you think going forward? What's going to happen? You know, I mean, we don't know um, as a nation and from a health standpoint, um, you know, when the vaccines are going to be here and all of that. 
Um, but you know, as uh, restrictions ease, what? How do you think it's going to play out at your firm um, in terms of continuing to work from home? So, and I, you know, for those who can see the webinar, that there was sort of a big smile on sort of how, how do I predict the future because there's so much uncertainty. At, you know, for our law firm, I think we're again the flexibility model will continue. And again, until there's while we're in this pandemic, it's really what I tell my clients as well. This is a numbers game and it benefits employers as well to reduce risk. I mean, no employer wants an outbreak at their workplace. So if work and productivity can continue on a model that reduces the numbers of people that are exposed, that sort of is mutually beneficial for everyone. It doesn't always work in every single industry, you know, sort of manufacturing their, their jobs that cannot be done remotely. But for the industries where work can be performed remotely, I think... I, you know, my clients and the clients that I talk to, everybody is looking at the flexibility model because the idea is to keep productivity going. And the more people you bring back to the workplace, that could jeopardize productivity. Um, I can give an example of a, a big New York law firm. I was speaking with one of the partners and he was saying that at one point they were going to try to come back. But, you know, this guy bills at like $1,000 an hour and it's going to take an hour for him in his, you know, midtown office building to actually get up to his office. Well, that's not productive for anybody, right? To sit in the lobby and be exposed to other people's germs and try to get to the office for work that he can be doing remotely. So I think our firm, we're, we, 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 we've sort of termed it sort of a slow roll. We're looking at things. We want to make sure um, there's flexibility and that our lawyers can get their work done and serve our clients the best we can. And understanding that everybody has responsibilities they may not have had pre-COVID. Like for example, my childcare responsibilities obviously have changed as have many, you know, nobody knows what's gonna go on with the schools. Nobody can necessarily dictate people's comfort level with uh, daycare or even, you know, babysitters. So all of those factors come in um, to making decisions. So that was a long answer to the short answer is we're going to continue to be flexible as long and allow our attorneys to work remotely as, um, as long as it makes sense. That's great. Okay. And so how about you, Brooke? What are you, what are you seeing at your own company and as an HR professional, what are you hearing in the HR community about, you know, are people, do you get the sense that people are going to be called back to the office? What are you going to do in your own company? Yeah, so we've been, I mean, now is the time where we've been talking to team members to get to get their feedback. We don't want to make decisions without having input from others. Um, so we have been having several kind of focus groups to get to get input there. Um, obviously, same thing as Rachel, we want to make sure everybody's safe first and foremost. Um, and especially being a manufacturing company where where on the shop floor people are dealing with heavy equipment and there is a real risk of injury, safety is always our number one priority. So we're, we're continuing to see what procedures we can put in place to ensure safety. Um, with that said, we're not pushing people back. Um, we understand that they may be um, immunity compromised, they may have conflicts with childcare, you know, everyone has a different situation. So we're not forcing people to come back. Um, we are going to be opening the office in the next couple of months. We're, we're doing um, a small pilot group next month to see how processes work, um, but we will be screening people when they come in. We will be having them take a survey to make sure that they are healthy and they and haven't been exposed. Um, but, but I think even so, even when the office is open, I think there's going to be a lot of people who will decide to take advantage of our flex work program um, just because of the things they've been missing out on by not having that. So for example, I talked to a senior leader recently, he's a VP, and he said, you know, this, this is kind of a blessing in disguise because I've never eaten dinner with my family before. And for the last couple months, I've, I've been home with my family for dinner and he said, you know, even if it means I have to log on for a couple hours in the evening, it's worth it for that extra time with my family. So I think a lot of people are realizing what they've been missing out on. Um, and I don't know that they're ready to give that up. I think people realize that it's um, life is short and those things are important and, and more important than they thought they were previously. So I think going forward, while the office will be open and we will allow people to come in, I think I think we're going to have a big uptick on the, the number of people who are actually take advan taking advantage of our formal program. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and you, you were mentioning that 
you know, everybody is going to have different needs. Uh, women um, who have children uh, might may have childcare issues. There may be people who have um, sp special health issues. Um, so that sort of makes it seem like there's not going to be a one size fits all company policy on this is the only way that flexibility is going to work. Is that is that true or? Yeah, it, it, it is definitely going to be a case by case basis and we're okay with that. We understand that everybody has a different situation. I mean, in my focus groups recently, um, there have been a lot of mothers on there, um, fathers too, but you know, most, most mothers are the ones with the burden of childcare and they are very stressed about what's going to happen in the fall if the kids don't go back and they have to continue distance learning and um, daycares aren't open, what do they do? You know, if we're forced to go back into the office, what do they do with their children? So we're, we totally understand that that is something that is unavoidable and it's, it's a difficult situation right now. So we're really trying to be as flexible as possible while still, while still making sure that the work gets done. And I think throughout all of this, we haven't had a problem with work not getting done. So people figure out a way to make it work. So if, it, if they're working seven to eight in the morning before anyone else logs on or they're working nine o'clock at night for a couple hours, the team has really just made it work. Um, so whatever works for them, we're, and as long as they're getting the job done, we're, we're comfortable with that. Okay. And so, uh, well, one thing I wanted to mention is that um, everybody on, on the webinar, please, um, uh, send us your questions um, and you can see the, the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. We're going to have um, time for Q&A at the end. So, um, so please send us your questions. Um, so Rachel, um, do you feel like as well that there's that sort of uh, need for a little bit of customization uh, of the flexibility um, or is it going to be more kind of across the board policies. I mean, in the past, they're in lieu of a real flexibility policy, you know, say in the company handbook, um, there have been a lot of one-off deals, a lot of under the radar flexibility arrangements, um, a lot of, you know, not telling your friend in the other department that you have this flexibility arrangement or whatever, but you know, how, how do you see that playing out? So the employment lawyer in me, you know, I cringe when I hear like sort of customization and don't add and tell because you know, the key to any employment law is similarly situated people should be treated similarly. So employers have to make decisions and I'm sure Brooke agrees sort of with compassion, understanding, and you do have to look at specific circumstances, but as an employment lawyer, you don't want to cut a bunch of side deals with a bunch of employees because all of a sudden you find out that actually everybody under 30 got one deal and everybody over 50 got another. And that's kind of a nightmare from an employment law perspective. So I, when, when I talk about flexibility, you want to build a plan, and this sounds like what's going on at Terex, that everybody is treated with flexibility, but you have to understand as well that there are certain responsibilities that employees are responsible for and that they have to meet those responsibilities within the confines of, of flexibility. So the, I sort of caution employers from at least from an employer point of view of making sure that all employees are enjoying the same offering of benefits. You know, for the, those who went remote in March, that was pretty easy because everybody went remote. That was the end of the discussion, right? Um, as the rollback, um, sort of is, as the rollback is rolled out, it, it depends very industry specific for employers and job specific, right? Certain jobs can be done remotely very easily, whereas others can't be. Um, so you want to make sure that at least employees are being treated fairly, even understanding what their needs are 
And then one other just issue as well, which may be outside the scope of this webinar, is to make sure those employees that don't have what we call traditional family responsibilities, sort of kids and stuff like that, are also being treated fairly because from an employee relations perspective, we do see a lot of that. I'm sure Brooke sees that too, which is just because I don't have a kid, I do have kids, but just because I don't have a kid, now I have to work, pick up everyone else's slack. You start to hear that kind of thing. Um, and we've been really both internally and externally for my clients trying to be careful for um, employees who in the beginning, you would think that this crisis would be easier for because they may have less family responsibilities. Maybe they skew younger, maybe their parents are younger and they don't have children yet, but they're also feeling very alone and isolated during this. So we've also tried to reach out and make sure that their, you know, their needs are taken care of as well. So it, it is a juggling act and a balancing act. Um, but I do caution against, at least from an employer's perspective, having a lot of different, um, different deals for everybody because that can that can turn around and be problematic from an right. employee perspective from an employee perspective you should be very transparent about what you need because you want to walk into a relationship so from an employee perspective i'd say ask for anything you need go for it um just from an employer perspective you have to be careful um i want to ask you about that but i want to just back up and ask you um since you do have a broader um, view as an employment lawyer, you're talking to lots of different uh, companies and different industries. You mentioned that um, that some of the um, companies do not, um, or some fun job functions or industries are not as conducive to working at home. Um, obviously, manufacturing would be um, one of them, or a, uh, a retail, or something like that. But but you know, with doctors and lawyers working at home now, um, you know, where are you seeing that it's not working so that women on the call could anticipate um, you're probably not going to find work at home in these industries? So the industries that I see it not that there's not a not there's not a work from home option is basically been manufacturing. I think, like, if you're running a machine, you just can't do it at home, right? Traditionally, there used to be that sort of assistant work was difficult in the legal industry. Assistant work was difficult from home. We've made it work. Um, and it, it's working. I'm not sure that is sort of ideal forever, but it's definitely working. Um, the other medicine, I think there are some physicians maybe on this call. I, I have, um, physician clients and health and practice group clients, you know, certainly tele telehealth works, but obviously sometimes patients have to be seen. I mean, we see that in the hospital that that doesn't work, you know, that doesn't work from home um, particularly well. Parts of jobs can work from home. So I think it's really looking at sort of the job task. The, the one issue I saw was sort of was accounting wor working remotely, which one would think would work fine at, remotely, you know, shouldn't be a problem. And I have clients who've seen differences between the spring and the summer. So I would caution, um, both employers and employees alike. Some of that may be childcare related, and you know there's federal statutes um, that have been passed, and there are going to be state statutes that pa that have, that are legislation that I anticipate that'll assist with that. But I think it's more been just sort of the overall fatigue and people, um, maybe employees just taking advantage of the weather and, and things like that. Um, and I would those are the first time I heard murmurs of this isn't working so great. Like this accounting function was really fine the first three months of the crisis and now June, July, they're just not getting things done. So again, with the work from home benefit, you want to make sure that work is getting done in the manner that an employer would expect it. Because that to me, accounting should be able to work from home. I can't imagine why that's not working other than um, general fatigue or people are sort of cutting more corners than they usually cut. So that's something else you want to be careful. But usually it's just manufacturing and anything that requires, you know, like retail, um, parts of it would work fine from home, but then obviously if you're having stores open, that doesn't work great. Right. So, um, Brooke, we, um, we talked about the fact that uh, Terex has um, an actual work from home program or they, that was in place before um, COVID. And you talked about that there are um, certain parameters and, and benchmarks that are, that are used, written benchmarks. Um, which is great. So kind of learning from that, I mean, not all companies, in fact, I think very few companies have that kind of um, structure to their flexibility program. So that's really excellent. But, you know, if you're not in a situation where that structure exists, I mean, 
drawing from your your experience, you know, what what do you think that women can be doing to show employers that um, that they are, um, you know, being very productive? I mean, obviously, if, if you meet a deadline, that's that's uh, clear that you are being productive. But there aren't deadlines every day. Um, there are long term projects. You know what? What can women do so that they're, you know, proving to their bosses, this is working and it's working for you and it's working for me? Mm -hmm. I think constant communication is so, so necessary, especially, especially now that, the, that we're home every single day um, and setting expectations. I've seen some, um, this is specifically related to parents, but some parents saying, look, the mornings are really difficult for me. So I'm gonna log in at 6.30. I'm gonna work from 6.30 to 8.30 when my kids get up. I'm going to be with my kids from 8.30 to 11. And then I'm, I'm dedicated to my work the rest of the day. So I think just communicating what you need is so important. And most employers are flexible, will be flexible and understanding. Um, but just letting them know, you know, during this time, it's really difficult for me and I will be in and out during these two hours and um, I am committing to get getting my work done, but the, this is a difficult time for me. So, um, and, and I've seen it and it's been working. I mean, it, who's to say that you can't get more done at 6.30 in the morning when nobody's bothering you? Um, so for us, it's really what works best for for our team members to be healthier, mentally healthier, um, being able to be there for their families. And, and I just wanted to mention something that Rachel said before about, um, you know, some, some people, people have different circumstances and are we discriminating based on their circumstances? But with our program, we made it very clear from day one that we don't care what your situation is. So, if you have kids and you want to be there to get them off the bus in the afternoon, or if you're single, no kids, just want to work from home a couple of days a week, we truly don't take into account what your situation is or give preference to people that are maybe in more difficult situations. It's truly open to everybody. Um, but we've, we have found that some departments and Rachel mentioned accounting and we do experience that in accounting where, um, you, you just have to be in the office. There has to be coverage to answer phones or to um, pick up the mail, whatever the case is. But some of our groups have worked together with their department to work on a flexible schedule that kind of works for everybody. So if four people in the department want to work from home on Fridays, maybe it's two work from home on Fridays, two work from home on Mondays, and then the opposite weeks they switch. So they're really working together to figure out a schedule that works best for the department too. Um, so for women, I would just say, you know, make sure you communicate that and communicate your needs. And even if it's not a hundred percent, you know, they're not a hundred percent supportive of it, they'll probably help you figure out a way that it works for you and for the team. Okay. Now, I mean, you can tell your boss, you can just, you know, speak to your boss on the phone or, or send an email and tell them, you know, I'm not going to be available from 8.30 to 11, but your boss might have, you know, 15 people on the team. Have you found that there are certain communication tools that are, that are helping teams, you know, monitor schedules, that sort of thing? I mean, we've been really flexible. I, I've, I haven't experienced any of my managers or my team kind of count, watching the clock and seeing if I'm available or if my you know little IM signal says I'm busy. I think people are just understanding that things come up during the day and as long as you're getting your work done, nobody's kind of hovering over you. Maybe that's unique to us. Maybe some some other companies or industries are different, but I think overall we've been we've been really really flexible and understanding. And I'm actually, I'm, a, I'm very proud of that um, because I know every company doesn't experience that. Right. No, that's good. I mean, it's kind of like the, um, the fantasy that everybody had that, you know, that employers would actually act like humans and, and, now, <laughs> and now they are, which is, which is really wonderful. 
Um, Rachel, have you seen any particular best practices in terms of, of showing uh, productivity, um, you know, that, that, that underscores that this work at home is working? Sure. I mean, and I also, you know, I think Brooke, and that I just sort of want to reiterate and emphasize because I think Brooke brought up a really good point. Like communication is the key. So, for example, I think in the beginning in law firms, there were a lot of these meetings while we were all working remotely just to like feel it out and make sure people are still there. And then finally, someone spoke up and was like, we have too many meetings, right? <laughs> you know, like this is getting out of control. And a lot of the meetings were at 12. And for those with younger kids, we're like, I got to give my kids lunch. Like this 12 o'clock meeting, what used to work when we were at work is a disaster now. And I think Brooke was sort of alluding to that. So there's sort of communication both ways, what works best. We have a women's committee meeting at my firm coming up with like a, a what we call a lunch and learn. And the irony is we're not doing it at lunch because at lunch for a lot of the women who have small children is the worst time to schedule a meeting. So we're doing like a 930 coffee. Um, so I think in general, um, for sort of best practices, communication is key. And, you know, we all work for somebody, right? Even, you know, I'm a partner, I still answer to people and I certainly answer to clients, which is you have to make sure that what you're offering as well works for, and I think Brooke alluded to this, what does work for the team, you know? So um, what I sort of advise um, employers is make sure they're there are options available, but at the end of the day, it is a job and you do have to make sure that something you're offering is wor is working for the people you're working for. So what I usually tell employees is, you know, it's say yes the first five times. So when you need to say no the sixth time, nobody even looks at it. But if you go into this, the situation where I can never ever do anything to help you, no matter how many flexible <laughs> options they offer you, that's not a great way to start an employment relationship. So I always just sort of think the best practices is, is try to make it work as much as possible so that when you need a, a special accommodation in terms of a schedule, not not a legal accommodation, that 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 they're available to that and follow up on things. You know, I think especially while everyone's working remotely, that's really key. Is you know, I did this for you. You haven't looked at it. Is that okay? And when I get those emails, I always say yes. I just haven't gotten to it, but I appreciate the reminder. So I sort of think those gentle reminders in the remote times are really helpful as well. Um, and then employers listen to your stakeholders. Again, don't schedule meetings that you think are going to boost morale. That is just one more thing on someone's plate. Like we had a lot of Friday remote happy hours, but it turns out people were really tired by Friday at five thirty, and they wanted to be with their family. So that's we move it. You know, you can move it to Thursday. Those kind of things. Just you know, be aware of the scheduling that you're um, asking people to comply with. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, we've talked about um, the fact that, um, you know, women should speak up um, about, you know, what their situation is. Um, and, you know, that makes sense when you are, you've been working for an employer, they know you, they know your work ethic. Um, what about if you're looking for a job now? Um, uh, Brooke, do you, do you advise that women, you know, talk about these flexibility needs very openly now? I think that it's, it's fine to ask what type of flexibility they have, because I think a lot of companies are moving in that direction because it's, it's necessary. I mean, there are going to be companies that are very old school and say you have to be in the office every single day of the week. Um, but it's even even so much as ad hoc flexibility, like I need to be home on Thursday because I'm getting something delivered and I need to sign for it. Or, you know, my kid is sick, I need to stay home and work remote. Or it's a snow day, I don't want to travel the 20 miles to work today. I think, I think even asking about that type of flexibility, even if it's outside of um, a formal program, is so important because some cultures don't even allow for that type of flexibility. And for a lot of people, I think that's all they're looking for. I mean, maybe they don't need to work from home three days a week, or maybe they don't need to switch their hours, but they want to know that the company has their back when something unexpected comes up and they don't have to use paid time off to do that. So I think it's fine to ask that type of flexibility and, and, and let them know that, you know, this is really important to me that I have a manager who's supportive of things like that when when I'm not when we're not expecting it. Right now, Rachel, as an employment lawyer, what do you think of talking about your flexibility needs in an interview? 
well, you're, uh, hopefully no client of mine's gonna ask, right? They may ask about flexibility, but they're not gonna ask about a family situation, um, at least not after I talk to them, right? So they, we're just not gonna ask about that. But, and, and when people are asked about sort of their family situation, um, they sh shouldn't be asked about it. And most employees or applicants are asked about it bristle at it in an interview because it is an inappropriate question. Um, that being said, I think Brooke um, sort of fashioned it appropriately to ask about flexibility, especially as an applicant is perfect sense because you don't, nobody's gonna ha be happy with a position that doesn't work. And whether or not that existentially should be the way things are, the reality is as an applicant, you're applying for a job that hopefully you want to work, that, that you can have a long, um, you know, a long run and be happy because you're gonna have to go to work every day. So um, you should go in eyes open. I also always say, once you've been given an offer, ask, or ask if you can speak to people on the team because that's an appropriate time to ask as well and say, you know, how does this work? You know, what happens if I need the, you know, if I need a different arrangement? If you're talking about part-time work anyway, that'll be a natural part of the conversation because you'll be talking about scheduling. But if you're talking about full-time work and you want to say, well, what happens if, you know, my child has a, an event at school? How, did, how is that handled? Always ask about what the supervisor does. So if the supervisor is running off to their event, generally that's a good sign that you're going to be able to run off to a, an event as well, maybe not to use PTO. And then in certain circumstances, you may use PTO. And I definitely have clients whose employees will do that, especially in September. I'm taking the whole first day of school off because I want to get them on the bus, I want to get them off the bus, and I want to, you know, hear about the day. So, you know, you just want to try to um, get as full a picture of the landscape as possible before accepting the position, because again, it's not going to benefit anyone if you can't deliver what they're looking for, and if you're unhappy or have to be looking for a position shortly thereafter. All right. Okay. And and sort of following along that line, um, I have always said as a career coach that in any economic environment, um, good people can find good jobs and that it's, it's really more about how you approach a job search than the, than the environment, um, the economic environment or the job market. Um, I know that um, in the economic downturn around 2008, um, there were many, many people that continued to get jobs, but they were, you know, they were the ones who were really going about it in the right way. Again, from your broader perspective, um, how are you seeing the job market? You know, with the fact that, you know, there have been layoffs and furloughs and pay cuts, you know, how should a job seeker feel about the job market right now? That's to me. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, Ooh, I, I, I agree with your analysis. I th my clients tend to need people working. So even clients that have had sort of to furlough, they're, they're not necessarily thinking this is long-term. Um, and there's definitely seems to be a need for people working. And I think it is a good time for flexible work because of pay cuts, you know? So if you're trying to maybe get back into the workforce, but you don't wanna be full-time, employers are looking for people to do work and may not be looking to necessarily bring on FTEs or full-time employees. So there may be a lot of opportunities there as well, um, sort of as a trial period. So I. I don't know what you, th I mean, so I'm not an economic expert. Um, I'm not a pandemic expert. I'm not a doctor. I was totally wrong about the pandemic, but I'd be done by May. So, so I'm like, I'm, right now I'm batting terribly. Um, so I don't know what the like sort of job market's going to look like. Um, and, and it's going to be very industry specific. So airlines, I don't think, and travel, I don't think that's coming back that quickly. Um, but, you know, and I don't know about retail, but I think, you know, what is it? Necessity is the mother of invention. So there's a lot of opportunities to refashion oneself or um, figure out something that you might not think about applying for. But if you're not working right now anyway, it's, a, you know, something to give a trial run to something because employers are looking for good people. I think you are right about that. Um, and when you find good people, you tend to find a role for them because you know they're good people and they're good workers and they're smart. So I wouldn't necessarily, I, I guess I subscribe to your same advice. There should be some opportunities available. Right. Um, and, and Brooke, how about at, at, at Terex? Are you guys still hiring? Are you, you know, are you, are you feeling like within your peer companies that there's still hiring going on and there's still opportunities for good people? <clears throat> It, it's definitely slow. I think um, with a lot of other companies, we, we 
definitely suffered during this. Um, we are in the business of selling products and um, we had a lot of canceled orders or delayed orders. Um, so if we're not selling our machinery, we're not making money. Um, so hiring has definitely slowed down. Um, and I feel like it's the same for a lot of companies. So I would say now is a great time to network. Um, and it, it will help you in the long run. Um, I would recommend, you know, reaching out to people you find on LinkedIn at companies that you admire and, and figuring out, you know, asking them for their advice on how to better um, market yourself and for jobs that you want at their companies. I mean, it's, it's a tough time. Um, yeah, and I don't, like Rachel said, it's hard to say when things are going to bounce back. I think it's going to be slow. Um, hopefully by the fall, we'll be hiring more than we are now. Um, but yeah, it's, we've, we've definitely taken a hit. Yeah. Um, well, you're also manufacturing, so that's a, that's yeah. a, that's a tough one. Um, one last question to you, uh, Brooke, before we go to questions. Um, what do you think that women can do to make themselves a more attractive candidate in this environment? I mean, is there anything that has changed, um, you know, to make yourself look, I mean, I have some ideas, but I'd be interested in what you say. I, I don't know that things have changed in marketing yourself. I think it's become a lot more difficult, obviously, with the unemployment rate and, and so many people looking for jobs. I think, um, especially now, it's so important to, you know, I've, I've been doing recruiting, too, in my role, and I see so many resumes every day, and I see what, what looks like people just sending out their resumes to different places and not putting a whole lot of thought into it. I think it's really important for people to tailor their resume and cover letter if they're going to write one specific to that job versus just using the same resume to apply to a bunch of jobs because recruiters look at your resume for what? four seconds, five seconds before they determine whether or not you're a decent fit for the role. So I would say really take a look at the, the resumes you're putting out there and make sure it's very specific to the job that you're applying to. So I'm going to use HR, for example. There's so many different areas of HR. If you want to do recruiting, make sure the top of your resume, the top bullets in your resume contain your recruiting experience. If you want to do, if you're then going to apply for a job that's specific to benefits, make sure all the benefits bullets are at the top of your resume. I think that's very important, right? It, it's always important, but I think it's so important now just because so many people are applying to very few jobs that are open that you really do have to make yourself stand out as the best candidate. So that great. Was nice. yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, and just to wrap up, I, you know, I think it's also a, a time to show that you have experience working at home and being productive, um, that it's, it's not something new to you, um, because, you know, not everybody can work well at home right off the bat. So um, that's actually a leg up, I think. Um, and also, um, I think that as Rachel was talking about, there, there are opportunities now, more opportunities um, for freelance and, and part-time work. Um, and so people who have that kind of experience um, working in a, in a more flexible arrangement, I think that could, that could potentially be a leg up as well. Well, this, this has really been great. I wanna get to um, some of the questions. Um, so, and kind of fo following what I was just talking about, uh, one question from Ellen is that, um, you know, how much are companies open to part-time and, and, uh, and shared work schedules? Um, that's a, you want to try, uh, answer that, Brooke? Are you seeing more? Yeah, so, um, we're our corporate headquarters, um, so we generally don't hire part-time. It's just not, we just don't have those types of roles usually. Um, 
we are looking into other types of arrangements because we understand after this it's going to people are going to have a hard time um, going back full time like I mentioned earlier, especially if childcare uh, isn't available or there's no um, you know kids aren't going back to school, which is a form of childcare. Um, so we are we're looking at different different avenues. It could potentially involve job share, um, potentially part time. Although, like I said, we generally don't hire that way. But we are we are talking to people and looking at different ways where we can be more flexible outside of our program. So I, I don't have an answer yet. Um, it is something that we're open to and we are exploring. And that's, that's just so wonderful to hear, you know, that, that you're really looking for, um, for various ways that, that people can work. What, what are you saying, Rachel? You know, part-time does offer employers benefits, meaning basically the irony that they don't have to provide benefits, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I would expect to see some of that, especially I think Brooke was right. Employers are probably nervous right now with the economic uncertainty of keeping, of uh, making big hires. So I think there's probably going to be an uptick in sort of part-time or consulting agreements or those kind of issues. Um, so maybe I'm just optimistic, but I think there will be a need for that because I think there was also maybe a bit of an over furlough and an over RIF, which is a reduction in force as people were concerned about like people being employers concerned about liquidity. So there's probably going to be a correction back the other way. So I'm, I'm optimistic about that, um, that there may be something there, especially, um, you know, benefits are really expensive for employers. So if there's an, a work situation where they don't have to provide benefits, that's what I would sort of classify as mutually beneficial. Yeah, and I, I think uh, that there's, you know, uh, there was a tremendous uptick in flexible work before COVID, and I, I can only see it um, uh, increasing. Um, okay, we have another question from Jennifer. Um, do you feel that there will be a bias, unconscious or not, against those who decide to remain working from home versus those who are able to go back to the office? I guess this is a question if, if, there is a choice of working at home um, versus going back to the office. Do you, do you, would you say, Rachel, I'll ask you first, that there could be a bias if you decide to stay home? It's a really good question. You know, nothing beats good work. I mean, it just doesn't. So if you're get, if everything's getting done and you're beneficial to the team, I, I think there won't be a bias. The complicated analysis of bias is how much of the bias is unfair and how much of the bias is based on different perspectives of what work is getting done. The, so the one thing I will say is COVID's a unique animal. So there used to be sort of this idea of the warrior, you come to work sick, you know, rain or shine or snow, and you, you know, you're coughing, but that means you're a great leader because you come no matter what. And COVID changed all that. You know, I had to talk to a lot of CEOs who are sort of in um, high risk groups. And I was like, you can't be in the office. You're just making people nervous, right? So, and I, I think that part is gone. The idea, you know, if someone comes in the office and they're like coughing and, and, you know, they don't look well, they're not going to be seen as a value. People are going to be irritated and hostile towards them, right? So I think there is less of a idea that being in the office means you're the true leader. I think the true leader or the true team player are the people getting it done, whether it's remote or in the office. All that being said, that's a very vague answer. I mean, if your workplace is saying everyone come back and you're the only one not coming back, that's a totally different question. <laughs> if, if you're asking what Brooke sort of described, which is the slow rollout and you have a choice, I don't think there's going to be a bias at all. I think people are going to appreciate you making good decisions that are good for your health and the health of the organization. You agree with that, Brooke? Yeah, I mean, in a perfect world, I would say no, there's no bias. It, it, like Rachel said, it's based on your work. Um, but unfortunately, I think there is, you know, the recency bias, you know, you, you've, you see somebody more frequently, maybe you're more apt to give them the promotion over somebody you don't really see that often. So I think, um, you know, for us, we are fully planning on training our managers on um, you have to be accepting of people who choose not to come back into the office because it is completely their decision um, and theirs alone. So uh, that's something that we're working on. But also um, my advice to people who do decide to stay home for whatever reason is just make yourself known. Um, you know, plan calls with people, reach out, um, you know, offer yourself to work on other projects if that's 
an option um, just so more people know you and know that you're staying active. Um, I think it's easy for us when we're working remotely to really get deep into a project and kind of block out everything that's going on. And it's different being from home because in the office, people walk by your desk and, and stop to chat for a couple minutes and that just doesn't happen when we're remote. So um, I think it's important, especially now to put in that extra effort to reach out to people either through instant message or on the phone or on a video call to just stay connected and keep kind of that human element active because I think when it comes to um, performance reviews and, and things like that, of course, it's going to be based on the work that you've done, but you want to make sure, especially your manager knows the work that you've done um, while you're home because it's a little bit different when you're not face to face. Right, right. Can I add something to that also? Um, like pre-COVID, uh, there was a joke in my office. Like I hated video because uh, I was just always in the office. And so I would never do a video call. It just, I thought it was weird and everybody looks weird. And like, that's an example of a total modification. I do it all the time now. And, and I think that helps. Like I can think of a couple people we haven't seen in video in four months. And you do start to wonder, you're like, what's going on there? So, you know, go outside your comfort zone and make those efforts. Not every day. I mean, we all, even on this call, we look very different than we did on the practice two days ago. <laughs> but you know, you just take, make those efforts, even if you're not comfortable with it, because I think then people do, it's all about like the recency. And I think Brooke made a good point and, and associate and they think, oh, you're the one with the house with the this and the that. So, you know, go outside your comfort zone just so you, you appear available regardless. Right, right. Um, Rachel, I think you um, said something about uh, when, when I was asking you about positions that work um, as an at-home position. I think you talked about assistance, um, or maybe I'm wrong, but... I probably mentioned just different classification. There's a question in there about assistance. Is yeah. that what you're getting to, the question? Yeah. yeah. I, I want to know, uh, Christine asked, you know, how are firms dealing with administrative positions like office managers and EAs? So um, our firm, they're remote, just like everybody else and doing a good job. And there was a run up to sort of their technology, I think had to be, they had to be sent laptops or you know, there's an IT issue because we had different, you know, we had different capabilities, but I think most firms caught up to that by now. Um, and so we've been able to make it work at Robinson and Cole. And I think a lot of law firms have, it, it depends on the size. I know there's smaller firms that didn't want to make the investment into the technology because there are only six people in the office anyway, and they could do that safely and distance. So I think it does depend on the size of the organization. Um, receptionists, this isn't our firm, but I have clients, receptionists is an interesting sort of classification because if you nobody's coming to the office do you need people to greet people at the office or if you're diverting phone calls so that probably is a bit of a unique analysis um, but in terms of supporting um, in admin support that seems to be doing fine remotely okay and how, how are you seeing it Brooke the administrative yeah same for us they're all home um, there was a little hurdle with technology as well um, but it seems to be going fine. I mean, I, I think it's a little bit easier for them now that our executives aren't traveling because a lot of um, their work revolved around um, travel and, and expense and stuff like that. So, um, but yeah, everything they are doing can be done remotely. So they're all home. Okay. Um, and so Brooke, I'll ask you the next question from Anne. Are you, um, are you seeing age discrimination as something that is, um, affecting hiring either full-time or part-time? I mean, this is always a question, COVID or not. I always tell women uh, it's an issue if you make it an issue. Um, what are you thinking? Yeah, we've never, uh, I personally haven't experienced that. Um, we are fully under the, um, under the mission to hire the best person for the job, um, regardless of any demographics. So I haven't experienced that. Um, we, and again, we don't take into account really anyone's personal situation either. So whether somebody has kids at home or not, doesn't, doesn't matter to us. It's, it's really about hiring the best person for the job. Right. Okay. Um, what about Rachel? You must have a, a, a great perspective on age discrimination. Uh, I Yes, I'm against age discrimination, just so, so that's clear. Um, you know, I, I'm not seeing an uptick on that. Right now, the biggest issues you're seeing are um, related to sort of FMLA and um, 
disability discrimination, right, because of the pandemic and whether people can come back to work or not. Age is less of, as we're seeing less of. Age is interesting to me because um, those who might fall into the class, I mean, legally the age protected class is 40, which is pretty young, 40 and up, but those who you're probably asking about much older, you know, 50s, 60s, they probably have a little more flexibility would be my guess, right, because they may have less um, family responsibility at that point. So it may be a time that they're actually a very attractive candidate and a, a certainly on experience, you know, with age comes a lot of experience, which employers like. Um, so I haven't, I'm not really seeing an uptick of that yet, but, you know, we're, you know, we're in the beginning of all this. Um, we'll see what the cases look like. Okay. Okay. So then our last question is from Lauren, and I think it's a really excellent question. It's, um, Basically that, you know, lots of women, uh, especially women who have families, are um, always looking for jobs that are closer to home um, and maybe not have a commute and certainly not a lot of travel. Um, but now that people are working at home, um, is it um, a smart idea to be looking farther flung for um, positions um, because if you're going to work at home anyway, it really doesn't matter uh, where you work. And I'll, you know, and I'll just add to that. I have um, coaching clients. I have um, one woman who lives in Costa Rica and she, she used to be um, an attorney in New York and she's working for an educational company in Europe. She's in Costa Rica. Um, I know another woman who is a consultant to Harvard Business Review and lots of um, uh, big name, you know, McKinsey and other big name firms. Um, she is in the wilds of, of uh, I think it's Colorado now, um, not even in a, in, a, in a big city. I know a lawyer in Vermont um, who is working as a partner for a big firm in New York City. So I think you, you can basically work for a company anywhere. So, you know, do you think that people should be expanding their job searches, you know, well beyond their immediate area? Rachel, do you have a thought on that? I mean, definitely an excellent question. I think it's a good point. My, you know, again, this isn't like empiric data, but my like anecdotal data is the New, New York is going to be really the last to reopen because they have the example I just talked about. They have, they have a lot of people have to get up into big buildings and they have mass transit issues. So especially if you're in Connecticut, this is an excellent time because a lot of at least the firms law firms, county firms, they're um, fin financial in, in the financial industry, they're not bringing people back quickly at all. So if they have room, it's a really good time to try to um, try to explore that. And, you know, again, with transparency, if they say, well, as of January 1st, we expect you five days a week, then that may not make sense. Or it may be a good time for you to get some a good high name company under your belt anyway to put on your resume. And if it doesn't work in, <laughs> in the spring when they want you there every day, you can figure that out then. And Brooke, um, do you see that, or that your firm is, is um, more willing to um, uh, consider candidates who are farther away? Um, well, like I said, we're not doing a ton of hiring right now, so I, I'm not really sure what that looks like, but I will say that I think if there were any time that um, companies would be more flexible to working from home at least a couple of days a week, it would be now. Um, so I, I don't think it's an odd question to ask. Um, you know, you have your phone interview with the recruiter, you talk about uh, work hours and stuff like that. I think it's a, fi a fair question to ask because I think uh, a lot of companies right now are, are taking a look at the way people work and do they really need all of that office space um, or could they be saving money on rent by having, you know, splitting, splitting um, like desk sharing with people and, and stuff like that. So I think it's, it's definitely a time to ask about that. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, um, that brings us to the end of our questions and, um, and the webinar. And thank you, Rachel and Brooke, for sharing such valuable information. I think um, we really covered a lot of great stuff. Um, and thanks as well to all of you who attended and asked great questions. Um, 
we are hoping to do more programming like this. Um, so stay tuned um, for future events that will be presented by Haven and Connect Talent. And um, in the meantime, Haven is offering a free day at Haven. If you send an email to them before 5 p.m. this Friday, the 25th. And I'll also be emailing all the participants directly about a complimentary career coaching session uh, to help you get ready for a full on job search or career reinvention after Labor Day or before. Um, so we look forward to spending time again with you very soon. Thanks for participating. <laughs>